Let me uh, welcome our guests and our audience here tonight to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. The headline of an article in yesterday's New York Times uh, announced, quote, money talks, close quote. Tonight's forum provides an opportunity for the managers who raise the money to talk to us. Our speakers reflect a broad range of perspectives from that of practitioners like Bob Farmer, Phil Smith, and Bernadette Bodie to an investigative commentator, Brooks Jackson, and a key referee, Thomas Josefiak. Moderating this discussion will be Sandy Maisel, professor of government at Colby College. If Professor Maisel looks familiar, it may be because last year he was a visiting professor at Harvard College, and uh, a few of you may even recognize him as a former congressional candidate from Maine. Professor Maisel has written extensively on the issue of campaign finance, his most recent book, Parties and Elections in America, addresses the role of money in the success or failure of congressional campaigns. So to run our panel tonight, introduce our panelists, and moderate the discussion, Sandy Maisel. Thank you, Graham, and I want to add my welcome to Dean Allison's. Uh, the subject of money and politics has been on the political agenda for more than two decades. It's been at the top of the agenda for that long. Uh, but some of you who are students of this know that the uh, study and the uh, legislation about money and politics goes back much further than that. The first Campaign Finance Act was the Tillman Act passed in 1907, and the Corrupt Campaign Practices Act, which governed us for most of this decade, was passed in 1925. Uh, but it wasn't really until the escalation of campaign spending in the 1960s with the advent of television as a medium of choice, with campaign spending in the millions of dollars, that citizens and citizens groups and politicians and journalists became terribly interested in this subject. After a very significant presidential commission under President Kennedy on this subject, uh, reform proposals boiled up for a while and eventually in 1971, Congress passed and the President signed the Fair Election Campaign Act of 1971, uh, which, was, which called for uh, public financing and presidential campaigns to go into effect after the 1972 election, uh, with some disclosures to go into effect during the 1972 election. And all of us who have studied the period are aware of the abuses that went on during the 1972 election that led, in fact, to the amendments of the uh, FECA in 1974, which set the basic outlines for how we fund political campaigns at the federal level today. And the basic outlines that were, that were in place then remain. We have disclosure and limits on how much money people can give to congressional campaigns and to senatorial campaigns. We have partial public funding and limits and disclosure for the pre-nomination phase of presidential campaigns, and we have public funding to the tune of $46 plus million dollars for each of the major candidates, plus soft money, which I'm sure we will hear about, for the general election campaigns for presidents. And we are going to discuss those tonight. It is terribly fitting, I think, that the Institute of Politics uh, sponsors this forum. The two most significant studies of campaign financing and the effect of the legislation have been studies done by the Campaign Finance Task Force of the Institute of Politics. And those of us who are on the panel tonight think this may be another opportunity to start that discussion over again. And I do want to thank Graham and Jennifer Jordan and Ashley Whitehouse, who uh, run the forums here, and especially my former student, Alexei Cowett, who was particularly significant in his role on the Student Advisory Committee in bringing us all together to have this discussion. What are the issues that we are going to be discussing? In the most basic form, they are how do we elect the people who represent us? And what is the role that money plays in that process? How is money raised? What is the role of technology in raising that money? From whom is money raised and how much does that matter? How is money spent during campaigns? Is enough available to the two candidates? Do we spend too much money? What should be the relationship between Procter & Gamble's advertising budget and the advertising budget of the two presidential candidates? Who, if anyone, should regulate how we spend money on campaigns? And what criteria should they use in regulating? What is the role to be played by political parties, by political action committees, 
by the Federal Election Commission, by the public, and by the media. And as I listed these questions, I thought to myself, what a wonderful panel the Institute of Politics has put together to discuss these questions because, in fact, we have just the right people to deal with them. Three of our panelists have been intimately involved in fundraising for some time. Bernadette Booty is the Vice President for Political Education of the Business Industry Political Action Committee, BIPAC to those who read the acronyms uh, and look at the funding that has been given by uh, various political action committees to various candidates. She has been with BIPAC since 1970, and those who are involved in this know that she is at the center of a communication network of people who are interested in what's going on on Capitol Hill, what politics are important, what part of congressional politics are important. Ms. Booty edits Politiket, I've never known how to say that word. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Politiket, which is a widely read monthly publication on Congress and elections. It is must reading for anybody who is interested and for all PAC officers particularly who are interested in congressional politics and in electoral politics. And I think it is fair to say that for those of us who are studying political action committees and campaign finance, she is probably the most widely recognized national spokesperson for political action committees as an important and effective means of political communication and political participation for those who uh, participate therein. Robert A. Farmer is a treasurer of the Dukakis campaign. During the primaries, he was mostly responsible for raising approximately $20 million for the Dukakis campaign, more than twice that raised by any of his opponents. He is the architect of the effort by the Democratic National Committee, the Victory Fund, to raise a significant amount of money, over $40 million, uh, through the Democratic National Committee to aid Democratic candidates in the fall. He has successfully raised money for the Democratic National Committee, for the Democratic governors, for the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, uh, and is generally considered the person who has turned the Democratic Party's fundraising efforts around and put them on a par, or at least near a par, with the Republican Party. At the uh, far end of the table was Philip S. Smith, who has been associated with the Republican National Committee since 1976. Phil Smith is currently Deputy Chief of Staff of the Republican National Committee and Executive Director of the Republican National Fan Finance Committee, which is the largest political fundraising organization, and perhaps the largest fundraising organization mm -hmm. in the country. From 1981 to 1985, Phil Smith was the director of the Republican National uh, Finance Committee, and during that period of time, they raised over $250 million, much of it through direct mail. And I just would like to add that both Mr. Smith and Mr. Farmer have also used their considerable fundraising skills to aid non-political, non-profit organizations in their fundraising, and the others have benefited from their skills as well. Where are you? Thomas J. Josephiak was nominated by President Reagan in 1985 and confirmed by the Senate in 1986 as chairman of the Federal Election Commission. The Federal Election Commission, which was established by the FECA, is the federal government agency which monitors campaign finance. Prior to that appointment, he served as special deputy to the Secretary of the Senate. The Secretary of the Senate, of the Senate is an ex officio member of the Federal Election Commission. And prior to that, he was general counsel to the Republican National Congressional Committee. So he, too, has ample expertise in raising money and in seeing how money is spent on political campaigns. As an FEC commissioner, Chairman Josephiak regulates, advises, monitors, and rules on all the campaign finance issues that we are going to be discussing tonight. And finally, to sort this all out for us, Brooks Jackson, who is sitting in the center of the panel, is a journalist who first with the Associated Press and now is an investigative reporter for the Wall Street Journal based in Washington has been looking at campaign finance issues for more, almost two decades. His articles on the 1972 campaign won prizes for uncovering the dairy industry's role in the campaigns of Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, and Wilbur Mills. He was co-winner of the Worth Bingham Prize for coverage of the campaign financing during the 1984 campaign when he detailed the delegate committees used by the Mondale campaign. And, and this is an unpaid political announcement, non-political announcement, uh, Brooks is the author of a new book just recently published by Knopf entitled Honest Graft, Big Money and the American Political Process, in which he explores the rising influence of special interests on Congress. The ground rules for tonight are quite simple. 
Each of the panelists is going to speak for between five and seven minutes. I am going to be very harsh with my gavel, which I don't have, but I will pound a fist. Uh, they will then be given a short opportunity to uh, comment on each other's, uh, the points that each, each of the individuals have raised, and then we are going to open it to you and hope that you will have a number of questions to present to them as well. The order was not determined by lot at all. I have asked those who raise funds first and asked them to go in alphabetical order. Ms. Booty. I think we can go from here. Okay. Well, let me begin by saying that a song title came to mind as we were introduced, which is Money Talks. The rest of the lyrics is, but it can't sing, and it can't dance, and it can't walk. So I think when you are in the role of the campaign fundraiser and the one who is involved with money and politics, you realize very quickly some of its limits. I also want to say at the beginning that I am not in Brooks Jackson's book, not in the index, not anywhere in the book. So I'm very <laughs> proud of that. Uh, as the opening speaker, it is perhaps uh, appropriate to begin with some general principles. And I have seven general principles here that may set the discussion beyond what Sandy had suggested we begin with. If we have time to get through them, we will. It's no surprise that since I represent the interests of the business community, I would start with principle number one, which is that I believe all economic and social interests have a right to participate in elections which includes the role of providing dollars to candidates. While this may be very difficult for elected officials to accept, the role of the elected official and the role of legislative process as we conceive it to be in our system is that the accommodation of conflicting interests is the role that we see exercised in the legislative process. The fact that we have conflicting interests is not troubling to someone in my shoes. Number two, I believe that the right of free speech and the right of assembly should be very broadly interpreted and should be defined as broadly as the public good will allow it to be. Number three, the system in which we have campaigns, the system that includes campaign finance, should encourage options for the giver as well as the recipient as long as the original source of those contributions is the individual giver that yes, political parties have a sacred role in our system, but they are not the only vehicle through which campaigns should be funded. Number four, whether we like it or not, we have a candidate-based system, not a party-based system. And because we have a candidate-based system, the candidate should be held accountable for the conduct of the campaign, which includes the role of campaign funding. And it is this reason that some in my shoes are fearful of independent expenditures because you break the linkage between the voter and the accountability of the candidate. Number five, regulations should exist to ensure fairness and disclosure and that a system to be fair requires that the bad actors be punished and that they be punished swiftly and appropriately. Number six, the system may not be perfect and even those of us engaged in political action committees are willing to acknowledge that it might not be perfect, but that the role of campaign finance and the narrower role of political action committees as they reply to the requests of the candidates are probably not responsible for the shortcomings of the system, and we can get into that if you like. Number seven, business PACs are and have been willing to discuss avenues for more successful, more effective, and more efficient campaign reform in whatever method we want to discuss, but that we refuse to be in response to the alarmists and that we are not at all persuaded by what the hostile critics have to say. As regard to political action committees, uh, let me say some other things. Number one, political action committees are pluralist. There are 4,500 of them, which demonstrates nearly all roles of the economic sector, nearly all views on social issues have a political action committee. The law is not at all hostile to those who wish to be involved in political action committees. In general, the law is fairly equitable. Number two, however you wish to refer to it, either in their, our responsibleness, our accountability, or our mainstream and institutional views of the system, political action committees have been participating in the system about as one would have expected. We give our money directly to candidates. We don't go out and try to subvert the system. 
We are about a third of all candidate receipts at the House and Senate level. Yes, we give more to incumbents, but so do other givers. Yes, we are bipartisan, but that's the nature of the entity. Number three, we're very open-minded. If you look at the top recipients of PAC money in House campaigns, the number one recipient is a woman. Who would have ever thought that? If you look at the top 50 recipients, you realize that four are women, four are blacks, there are Hispanics, there are Asians, there are Jews, there are representatives from every state on that list. We have been much more open-minded in our giving than most critics would have expected us to be in the beginning. Four political action committees are fairly modest. If you look at the current data on what's happened just in this election cycle, the average political action committee has spent about $31,000 on candidates. It represents somewhere about 5% of the eligible political action committees giving about 5% of the legal limit have given not any more than you would have expected giving uh, based on any other kind of givers. We are not at all anywhere near the role of $5,000 per candidate per election. Number five, political action committees represent an avenue for small givers teachers, social workers, whatever other group you can imagine in society, we are the avenue for those small givers to accumulate their dollars in a meaningful sense to give to candidates that we might wish to support had we only known about them. Six, we do shore up with our dollars as political action committees in an organized and focused way the contributions of constituent or issue interests in states. Number seven, political action committees are highly regulated. We are regulated in who may be asked for support, how they may be asked, the technique of raising monies, and all of the other things as far as limits are concerned, we are very highly regulated. And uh, number eight, probably the most important, is the contributions from political action committees are disclosed on a monthly or quarterly basis. We are required to report the contributions and expenditures of over $200. All of that information is open to the public as it gets closer to the election virtually on a 24-hour basis at the Federal Election Commission. Now, as I mentioned, there are some things that uh, those of us who are practitioners and participants over a long period of time would be willing to acknowledge are not good about the system. From my view, PACs are too timid, we're too late, we're too unfocused, we're too willing to be victimized. And if there is to be reform in the system, political action committees are willing to place the burden on the requesters of contributions. We are willing to say that we are regulated, we are focused in what the law allows us to do. Maybe it's time to take a look at the candidates. Maybe they should be regulated in how they ask for contributions. Maybe there are things about the use of dollars in elections that aren't being used in campaigns that could be tightened up. Maybe we do need to look at increasing what political parties and individuals are willing to give to political action committees. Maybe we should encourage small givers by reinstituting the tax credit or the tax deduction. But basically, we believe the PAC system has allowed the small giver a vehicle for meaningful participation in races that had the individual known about these campaigns might be willing to give on their own, but $100 on an individual basis is not nearly as meaningful as $1,000 from a political action committee that represents one's interests. Thank you, Bernadette. I was thinking uh, how glad I am that I don't have to be like Bernard Shaw and trying to find the lights and get them going in the right, in the right order. Uh, Bob Farmer. This worked just fine. As long as I don't have to be the one keeping here, we'll pass you can it push over it down here. Now. Push it down. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I was trying to think what would be most uh, illuminating when I was thinking about making my opening remarks. There's two things I'd like to cover. First, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about campaign finance reform. I'm sure if Governor Dukakis becomes President Dukakis that that will be one of the first things on his agenda. And secondly, I thought it would be helpful to share with you some of the little vignettes that I've learned as to the psychology of why people give to political candidates. I've always been kind of intrigued by that. Let me begin then by talking about the reform. In 1974, uh, a reform, finance reform package was passed. It said on presidential campaigns, the limit will be $10 million that can be spent during the primary season, $10 million, and that no individual, only individuals can give, no corporations or uh, PACs could give, 
uh, it would be limited to $1,000 and $5,000 to PECs. Now, there was an exception to that. It said the $10 million that the candidates can expend can be increased based upon the cost of a living uh, allowance. So because of inflation today, the candidates are permitted to spend upwards of $23 million. That's the amount of inflation since 1974. But what has remained constant is that $1,000 from individuals and the $5,000 from political action committees. Uh, so the first suggestion I would make is that the $1,000 be increased comparably so that you could give a limitation of 2300 comparable to what they're permitted to spend. And the reason for that is very simple. The candidates are forced to begin their campaigns earlier, and they're forced to spend more of their time on fundraising rather than addressing the issues and thinking about the issues. And I think that that doesn't serve the American people uh, all that well. I also uh, would try and make them more publicly finance these campaigns. The way to do that, the, right now, the way the law reads is only the first $250 of that $1,000 gift is matchable by the federal government. I'd make everything matchable. Just makes it more publicly financed. You still have to pass the threshold of going out and raising money in a lot of different states and demonstrating that there's some broad-based popular support for your campaign. But in the Dukakis campaign, for example, we had over 150,000 contributors. So the people are out there if you uh, reach out to them effectively. Uh, now, on the psychology of fundraising, I'll tell a couple personal stories because that's the best way I know to demonstrate a point. Uh, I am a graduate of another Ivy League institution, uh, Dartmouth, and every year I religiously gave 50 or 100 bucks to the alumni fund. And on the occasion of my 15th graduation from Dartmouth, one of my classmates called and asked if he could come see me. I said, of course you can. And he came by and he sat in my office and admired my office, asked how well I was doing in business. I was happy to tell him. And, uh, at, and he started then talking about Dartmouth and what it had meant to us. And uh, all the time he's talking, I'm saying to myself, this is going to cost me 500 bucks. I just know it. <laughs> and at the end of that, he, he turned to me and he said, so therefore, uh, this is our 15th reunion, and I think those who have the financial capacity should help. And we would like you to make a leadership gift, and I'd like you to write a check for $5,000. My God, when I picked myself up off the floor, I wrote the check, and I felt good about it the next day. But I realized I had gotten direct mail, I had gotten telephone marathon calls at night. I would never have written that check if he hadn't have taken the time off as a volunteer out of his busy schedule and come to see me and ask me to make that commitment. So raising money, is it, whether it's in politics or for eleemosynary purposes, is a very personal thing, very personal thing. I was talking to a very well-known politician recently, I won't mention his name, and he said to me, uh, he said, or I said to him, why do you think people give you money? And he said, well, because they like me. And I said, no. He said, because they like my issues. And I said, no. He said, well, I don't need a goddamn primer on how to raise money. Why do you think they give me money? And I said, because they don't want to say no to the person that asks. They don't want to say no to the person that asks. Think about that, if you've ever been solicited for money. In the Dukakis primary campaign, we met with over 1,150 individuals, asked them to raise a minimum of $10,000 to serve on the National Finance Committee. I'll walk you to give you a little overview of how this thing was set up. 1,150 people asked them to raise a minimum of $10,000. That's not so easy to go to 10 friends for $1,000 or 20 at 500. Uh, of those 1,150, 900 delivered the $10,000. They were on our National Finance Committee. The next break point was the Finance Board of Directors. And if you raised $20,000, you got to be on the Finance Board of Directors. Of those 900 people who had delivered the 10, 300 delivered $20,000, and they were on our finance board of directors. And then the next break point was $50,000. Now, there are 240 million Americans, and out of those 300 people who had delivered 20,000, 75 delivered 50,000. It's a lot of work. And then the last break point was $100,000. And out of this whole entire country, 23 people 
raised $100,000. And that's how our system was done. Very much a broad-based grassroots campaign involving people. Traditionally, people, political campaigns used to rely upon a few fat cats. We didn't do that. I got a call a few months ago from a friend of mine who's governor of a western state, and he, he's the heir to a big fortune. And he had been elected governor and spent a considerable amount of his own money to do it. And he thought for his re-election campaign, it'd be a nice thing if it were more publicly financed. So he, he called me and he asked me about it. And we talked for about an hour and a half. And based upon that, he invited me to come out and talk to his finance committee. And I went out there and talked to him and uh, so forth. I was out there just a couple months ago. And, and they, he said, Bob, he said, I want to tell you, he said, we just had the biggest fundraiser, the previous biggest one, it had been $150,000, and we just did 700000 And he said, I give you a lot of credit for the success of that fundraiser. And I'm always willing to take credit for any success. And uh, he said, there were two things that you told me that really struck home. Well, I was a little upset about that. After all, I had talked to him for an hour and a half. <laughs> but I, I always want to learn. So I said, well, what were those two things? And he said, the first thing you taught me was that if a person raises $10,000 for me, it's probably going to cost them 10000 out of their own pocket over the next 12 months because their neighbors that they went to are going to come to them for the cancer fund and the hospital building fund and whatever, it else, whatever else there is. And he said the second thing you taught me was when I would go to a, a party way across on the other side of the state uh, at someone's home and I'd walk in and I'd see 200 people there, I'd say, wow, I'm really popular here. And what you taught me was that I'm not really popular. The person giving the party is really popular because they came out to see him. So that, uh, getting back to it, fundraising is a very, very personal thing. The other day I was in New York City, and a person handed me a very big check. And he said, Mr. Farmer, I have just one question for you. And I said, what's that? He said, is this hello or goodbye? <laughs> uh, our campaign, we've tried to run it so it's hello. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I, I told Phil that I would say this before he be, began. Uh, there's no reason that he is sitting down to your left. It just happened to be the way the people were put at the table. Phil Smith. Thanks. Um, I'll just give you a, a little overview of what the basic ground rules are we're playing with now, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side. For one, you as an individual cannot write a check to the candidate, the presidential candidate of your choice. You can't write a check to George Bush for president, nor can you write one for Mike Dukakis for president. That responsibility falls uh, to the federal government the, through the tax checkoff system, uh, which provides $46.1 million to both candidates upon their nomination, and another $8.3 million may be provided through uh, both of the national committees of the two parties. Uh, Beyond that, the only way you can directly influence that is through that fund, that $8.3 million fund uh, established by the two party committees. Um, so the, the candidates are basically working with a $54.4 million budget during this election cycle, during this election year. Uh, what both parties have attempted to do is expand that uh, budget to do other things. Uh, to help our presidential candidates through state and local party organizations and also through the national party organizations. You've heard a lot about soft money. You may have read a lot about it in the press where uh, large sums of monies are being raised from corporations and individuals and political action committees uh, to support state party efforts. Uh, these are very important grassroots efforts uh, to register voters, to turn them out on election day. Uh, the 1979 amendment to the Federal Election uh, Campaign Act provided for uh, a number of volunteer activities to be conducted by state parties. Uh, and these voter turnout, voter registration activities, phone banks, are all financed through this quote-unquote soft money drive that, that you've been hearing about. Uh, it's estimated that, that on, on the Republican side, uh, those soft money uh, drives will exceed uh, Twenty-five, thirty-five million dollars. I'm sure uh, the Democrats will raise a similar amount uh, at the rate they are going. Uh, but those are important. Uh, some call them loopholes, but they're they're an important vehicle to encourage participation in the system. 
Uh, the second uh, thing that they're important uh, is that they they indicate that there's a weakness in the public financing system of presidential campaigns as it exists. Uh, uh, $54.4 million uh, does not go a long way uh, in running a national campaign. Uh, advertisers uh, for uh, consumer goods, such as a laundry detergent, will spend several hundred million dollars a year in an advertising budget. Uh, a media the media buys, for instance, in the Super Tuesday states is well over $5 million, yet you're, you're, you're only working with a $23 million primary budget to begin with. Uh, the absurdity of, of, of the system is that all of the state limits in the, the spending limits in the primaries uh, equaled $70 million. But uh, the limit to the candidates was, what, $23, 24000000 million, not including fundraising costs. So it sort of highlights some of the odd little peculiarities of, of this public financing system we're dealing with. That's why things seem so confusing when you read about them in the paper, but uh, we hope we can answer some of the questions you may have uh, later in the evening. Thank you very much, Bill. I was wondering how I was ever going to pass this note all the way down to the other end of the table. You <laughs> solved me that problem. That's right. Tom Giuseppe. Thank you very much. Um, just sitting here and listening to what's been said so far, why do I feel like I'm at the center of this controversy? Um, that's done for a reason. I look at the panelists, and Bernadette probably is wondering what the Commission is going to do with, with PAC's ability to act as a collecting agent for political contributions for federal candidates, the so-called bundling issue. Uh, Mr. Farmer and Mr. Smith over here, they're fundraisers, and their primary concern is how can they raise the most money under legal terms for their candidates or political organizations and leaving the legal niceties to their election law attorneys. Uh, you have Mr. Jackson over here who is a uh, who has been critical of the commission, who follows the commission very closely and looks at what we do and don't do and what's reported and what's not reported and writes that in the Wall Street Journal from time to time. The fundamental issue, though, before we get into any of these problems is what is the role of the Federal Election Commission? It's interesting how we've all taken for granted that there is campaign finance laws. And maybe that's not so unusual since these laws have been on the books since the 1800s. But what makes this law more unusual than the rest is that there is a so-called independent regulatory agency that is supposed to monitor all these rules and regulations. And what are we supposed to monitor? Well, the election law, when all is said and done, is basically a disclosure law. From time to time, all political organizations dealing with federal elections have to file campaign finance reports, all monies raised and all monies spent. There's also another provision, and that provision deals with limits and prohibitions. Certain contributions are allowed and some, some are illegal. For example, corporations and labor organizations cannot contribute to federal candidates. They can contribute through their political action committee, the things that Bernadette was talking about. That is the primary role of the Federal Election Commission, to enforce disclosure and to enforce the limits and prohibitions of the Act. Now, that's the easy part of it. What are those limitations and prohibitions and how do we enforce this law? Well, very clearly that if we find a violation of the law, we will assess a civil penalty and get an admission of a violation on the public record. And believe me, it's easier to get money out of a candidate to pay a civil penalty than have a candidate admit to a violation of the law. No one wants that on the public record for their political future. And that is primarily the biggest deterrent, I think, that the Federal Election Commission can do. Now, there are critics of the Commission, and I think, personally, the criticism of the Commission goes to the law rather than to the agency. And certainly there have been occasions in the past, before I got there, Brooks, where... <laughs> where the, the Commission could stand some criticism and can still stand some criticism for not moving quickly enough. But I think the biggest problem with the critics of the Federal Election Commission is not with us, but with the law. We try to enforce the law as it is, not like people would want it to be. That is for Congress. Congress sets the policy. We will enforce that policy. In a, in a way, we have an easier role to hoe here. All we do is enforce the law as it's written. And quite frankly, there are some gray areas of this law. And Brooks will tell you from time to time we get involved in those, those discussions either privately or publicly. 
Uh, hopefully, we will discuss it privately before we see it in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. Uh, but we do have those issues. But Congress, on the other hand, has a very different role to play. Early on in this law, there was a Supreme Court ruling, Buckley versus Vallejo. And in that court ruling, the Supreme Court recognized that contributions were political free speech, protected under the First Amendment, but also recognized the government's right to regulate, to a certain degree, contributions and certain spending limits. And the rationale was there was a compelling interest to prevent corruption or the perception of corruption. In that same opinion, the court said, however, that an individual or a political organization could spend unlimited amounts of money if it were truly independent. There's no coordination with the candidate or the candidate's agents. So you couple that together and what you've got is Congress looking in any reform measure the difference between First Amendment right to free speech and the balancing of a government's right and authority to regulate in this area. That is the balancing act. And that's why I think it's very interesting to see that every time Congress carves out an exemption to the law, exemption from the definition of a contribution or expenditure, critics will call it a loophole. Keep in mind in the discussion today, what is the role of the FEC under current law? What should it be is a different question. That's up for Congress to decide. And also, when we discuss these reforms, what is the balance between the First Amendment right to speech and the government's role in enforcing these laws? Thank you. I've never had this easy a job in keeping people to their time limit. Uh, Brooks? And now you want me to sum up That's what right. it all means. No, I want you to tell us what it all means. That's what right. it all means. Well, I feel like the skunk at the garden party, I guess. Um, from where I sit, we have a campaign finance system that's utterly out of control, getting worse and reaching crisis proportions. I want to talk first about the presidential system for a moment and then about what I think is uh, the more serious problem, the, the congressional system. At the presidential level, you have, in effect, no limits whatsoever on what individuals can contribute. It is a mark of how completely the laws have broken down through uh, various interpretations that you can now say and be accurate about it that Governor Dukakis is showing self-restraint when he merely takes hundred thousand dollar checks because as a practical matter the, his campaign through the Democratic Party could take a check in any amount from any donor and in fact the Democratic Party last year took a one million dollar check from a California donor this is before uh, Governor Dukakis was the nominee this year, the Republican Party took a uh, donation, I think it was of stock, wasn't it, fell of more than half a million dollars from a former ambassador. Um, corporations can give even though since 1911 that's been, uh, it's been prohibited for corporations to give directly to federal candidates. Unions can give. I haven't found anybody who's taken money from an Arab sheik yet, but uh, there are ways to do it if they want to. Um, we are now seeing a kind of arms race mentality in which uh, Robert Farmer astonished everybody a few months ago by announcing that he was going to raise, in addition to the public funds that were going into the, to the Dukakis campaign, $50 million. Phil Smith and the Republicans didn't believe him at first, but it looks like he's going to do it. Robert Mossbacker now claims, and he is the finance chairman of the Republican Party, I forget the titles, but one of the fundraisers there say, I'm going to raise whatever Bob Farmer raises plus a dollar. The fact is, uh, although the law envisions pretty complete disclosure, we don't know where this money's coming from yet or where it's going. The Democrats may have made one voluntary unaudited disclosure in the midst of the Republican convention, promised to make another one after the election is over. Republicans have showed us, uh, and I applaud them for this, uh, another voluntary unaudited list of donors complete through, I think it was uh, uh, end of August, September, September. Um, and there may be another one later on. So they're a little ahead of uh, the disclosure game, exposing themselves a little more than, than uh, Democrats are. Um, neither party will disclose the contributors to their building funds, which is a completely unregulated pot of money that each of them can uh, accept from in, in any amount from any source that frees up money for other purposes. The fact is we've gotten back to, we are headed back toward the system we had before Watergate when the Tillman Act had broken down, when the Corrupt Practices Act had broken down, 
Uh, we are rapidly sliding down a slippery slope toward no limits whatsoever and arbitrary voluntary disclosure. They're going to disclose what they feel like disclosing when they feel like disclosing it. Um, that's not the system the public and the Congress thought it was buying onto in 1974 <coughs> when they responded to the Watergate scandals with the creation of the Federal Election Commission and a new set of campaign finance laws. Nobody wrote the law this way. This is the way it has evolved through uh, permissive legal interpretations, through lawyers on each side who uh, find uh, a little more wiggle room in uh, this regulation or a little more wiggle room in that regulation, or who just go ahead and do things without asking permission and find that the Federal Election Commission, sometimes on a 3-3 vote against their own counsel's advice, simply doesn't take any action against them. Um, there, now, there's some good things about what's going on. Uh, to be sure, we are seeing probably more uh, human involvement in the presidential campaign this time than we've ever seen, but well, certainly than we've seen in recent uh, elections. Each party is spending, in California alone, close to $5 million hiring staffers to go out and knock on doors, precinct workers, and uh, it's not just a pure TV and uh, airplane campaign anymore. There's a lot of stuff going on on the ground, and that's probably to the good. And probably one thing that I think about is um, maybe the, the 46 million that we set aside in public funds isn't nearly enough. Maybe we really need 100 million dollars plus inflation to to run a good presidential campaign with a lot of citizen involvement. Uh, certainly, we need to address. Congress needs to address in the next year issues of disclosure issues of ought we to allow $100,000 campaign contributions. In effect, that's what they are. Ought we to allow corporate money to be used as, in effect, it is being used. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about congressional elections, where the real problem is. Bernadette said a moment ago that uh, the laws that applies to political action committees is equitable. Anybody can set up a PAC. And uh, I can't remember the, uh, the legal scholar who said it, but uh, it reminded me of the famous quotation that the law and its majesty prohib or, uh, prohibits uh, prote the, both the rich and the poor alike from sleeping under bridges. The law allows poor people and rich corporations alike to set up political action committees. Uh, we have today in the Congress uh, an increasing reliance on special interest money. It's not just PAC money alone, because an awful lot of it comes through individual businessmen, individual lobbyists, a few statistics. Democratic members of the House of Representatives who run the place, who've run it for 34 years, who are likely to run it to the end of this century under the present system, get, on the average, 50 percent of their re-election money from political action committees and a whole bunch more of the rest from lobbyists, from businessmen outside their state who are or, whose donations are orchestrated by lobbyists, and that, those, that number grows each election. More and We are getting more and more reliant in the Congress on special interest financing. Uh, political action committees give currently, uh, and these numbers tend to shift a little bit depending on what period you're talking about, 85 percent of their money to incumbents. They may give to women, they may give to Hispanics, they may give to blacks, but let me tell you, they got one thing in common. They are lawmakers. <coughs> That's because the money, let's face it, the money is given not generally for ideological purposes, although there are some PACs that are ideological. There are some that give um, to elect people who are not incumbents because of ideological reasons. But by and large, the money is given by lobbyists to open doors to lawmakers because Congress controls tax breaks, because Congress controls federal grants, because Congress controls regulation of business. And the money isn't uh, – always volunteered, a lot of it is squeezed out of lobbyists and political action committees uh, through pretty severe means. And I'll tell you an interesting story. I think that if you scratch a PAC manager these days, you're going to find a reformer, more likely than not. One fellow who was in the index of the book and who I was kind of wondering how he was going to take it called me up, invited me to lunch, loved the book bought ten copies for himself and all his board of directors, had me sign them, and said, this book is going to be a catalyst for reform. This is a manager of a major political action committee who was basically fed up with the system. It wasn't serving his interest anymore, and he was just tired of it. Incumbents are tired of the system. You now have, even, even though it serves incumbents' interests, 
98 percent of all the House members who ran in the last election were reelected. Part of the reason is that they're the ones who can raise the money. Challengers can't. Good challengers aren't even running. And the challengers who do run don't have the means to uh, mount an effective campaign. Costs on the average in a House election half a million dollars to win a, a contested election, one in which uh, the outcome is 55-45. Um, next year, you will see, I predict, a very interesting debate because PACs are sick of it, incumbents are sick of it, and Republicans who have been the primary defenders of this system, thinking erroneously that business political action committees were going to be their friends, have discovered that Democrats were getting most of the money all along, Democrats are getting increasing amounts of the money, and now people like Bob Dole, uh, who called in a group of PAC managers the other day to give them a little woodshedding session and threaten them with reform if they didn't give more money to his candidates, are coming around to the idea that maybe we'd be better off without political action committees. It was no accident that Dan Quayle at a, in the presidential or vice presidential debate called for elimination of PACs altogether. Have I run out of time? You have indeed. Well, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been a pleasure for all of us to listen to all of you on, on these important issues. And as I said at the beginning, I would like to uh, give you a chance uh, in turn to respond to what your fellow panelists have said. I will be a little uh, harsher with the, uh, the gavel so that the audience has a chance to participate. But I think particularly uh, in the last five or six minutes, we heard some differing points of view than some we had heard earlier, and I'd like to have the panelists have a chance to respond. Bernadette, would you like to uh, begin, or would you like to defer? Well, I would rather defer, but with just one comment, which is I think you see the diversity of what we represent. You also see the diversity from the perspective that we have in the races in which we participate. Uh, Business Industry Political Action Committee participates only in elections for House and Senate races. We participate only in those races we deem to be close and competitive as far as business is concerned, which gives us a much different pattern of participation for all of those 4,500 and some political action committees that you see organized. You'll find a much different view on how the world is organized and what their role is. Very few of them will participate in the presidential race and therefore very few of them will care about the things that Mr. Smith or Mr. Farmer care about in raising the $100,000. So I think it's an important thing to keep in mind that even though you can narrow down the topic to campaign finance, you find that it's a, a different view based on whether or not you participate in House and Senate elections, whether your view is one of a PAC that is um, parented, or whether or not your view is to change the system or to just uh, give to incumbents. Bob? Well, Bernadette, uh, during the primary season, uh, Governor Dukakis elected not to take PAC money, nor in the, uh, in the, at the DNC level. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided not to take that, nor corporate, nor union treasury money. We've, and we put the limitation on, a uh, very high limitation, we put one on nonetheless. And we were the ones that, uh, actually at Brooks's suggestion, I uh, de decided that it would serve the public to have disclosure. And uh, we will, you know, you will see at the end of this cycle exactly what the sources of revenues were. I think that uh, PACs, personally, just my own opinion, uh, d do create abuses. You were talking about all the types of people and their religion and their sex and this, that, and the other thing. But I, I was thinking to myself, I'll bet a lot of them are chairman of committees or, you know, uh, have, have some power. There's a reason people give uh, PAC money to candidates, and I think it's an abuse of the system. In the presidentials, uh, it doesn't matter that much even in the primary thing. We didn't take it a lot. Some of the others did. I can take a, one of our competitors took quite a good deal of it. But many PACs by their charter are precluded from giving money to presidentials because they figure they, it doesn't get them very far. You know, they can't get much influence with the presidential when he's raising twenty, thirty million dollars and they can just give five thousand, so why bother? Well, so there's a lot of grief from your own contributors yeah. too, who have choices. Yeah. Um, uh, Phil, I'd like to challenge you a little bit. Uh, you know, there's no mandatory you know, requirements, but we at least have said we aren't taking PAC money, we aren't taking corporate money, we aren't taking union treasury money. We've put a limit on it, which you haven't and uh, you followed our lead in disclosure. But, uh, you know, I think there are abuses inherent here. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure them out, and I think that the Republicans ought to 
consider doing just what we've done. You know what the abuses are as well as I do, and uh, I, you know, I think it would serve the public interest well, and I don't think you're going to run out of money by imposing the same sorts of limitations on it as uh, we do. And uh, Brooks, uh, you might be surprised, not too much, but because we've talked, but I agree with all of your criticisms. But I refuse to apologize for trying to create a level playing field for the first time with the Republicans. My God, they outraised us in 1984, either 5 or 10 to 1, not 5 or 10 percent, but 5 or 10 to 1. They've got a system here. They've been driving Mack trucks through these loopholes. And we're, all we're trying to do is to, to, to raise the same amount of money. We don't want to give them uh, that competitive advantage. And lastly, just so you won't feel that I neglected you, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I would say, I would say, uh, I would say the problem with the uh, Federal Election Commission is it's a toothless tiger. Uh, you know, they, I can remember working on campaigns and there were violations or they were imposed or assessed four years after the fact. They aren't done in a timely manner. They drag on forever, and then you get a $5,000 penalty. I mean, that, what, that doesn't do much. I, mean, I heard what you said about the biggest club you have, the biggest club you have, is that the, the people don't want to be assessed at all as having had any violation. But, you know, it generally isn't even the candidate. He's responsible ultimately, but some well-meaning, aggressive person does something that's in violation, or there's, you know, the candidate doesn't know if they bought two extra trucks came into Iowa or something, you know, he's, but that's what happens. So I think it's a toothless tiger. You sort of have the feeling you've been the, uh, watching a heavyweight fight and they were uh, sparring a little bit for the first round. Uh, Phil, do <laughs> you want to respond to any of that? Yeah, I would just like to, you know our, our sources of uh, income, Bob, or the, the press, the public does, we've disclosed, we have for the last four years. Uh, you followed our lead, we didn't follow yours. Paul Kirk refused to disclose uh, sources of contributions until uh, Governor Dukakis was, uh, became the nominee. Uh, your book's uh, soft money had been previously closed, and I think Brooks can back me up on that. Uh, secondly... Um, when did we follow your lead? He, he hadn't done it, but we did it first. Right, but I, I'm saying yeah. you followed our lead on the disclosure because we had been disclosing that money from day one for the past two or three years. I'll leave it to Brooks because he prints those disclosures. <laughs> he can arbitrate that. I, uh, I disagree. But secondly, you've refused to disclose your uh, contribution income until the election's over. Uh, why is that? We made one uh, disclosure. The reason we determined not to make the second, we disclosed the revenues and the expenditures at the same time, and we didn't want to give away our game plan. We felt that that would be telling the opposition, if you know where we're spending it, you know pretty well what our strategy is. But we think that it is important and we'll disclose it on November 15th, all the balance of the contributions. I think we reported, I don't know how many millions we reported through August 15th. Mm -hmm. We for, were criticized. For just two months, though. Yeah. You just reported two months. Two of the four months, yeah. Report the whole year. Well, wasn't that from January 1st? No, just two months. Okay, June I'm not sure. Tom? No, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, listening to this debate, let's makes my heart start moving a little bit here, but there are a couple things that I, I need to address, and, and this gives you exa exactly the example that I was referring to, that we've, we've heard the statements made that the whole thing is falling apart, election finance reform is, is going backwards instead of forwards, and we've heard little comments like, we've been raising the money, which I think, when you take everything else away, is adding to this what I consider misrepresentation of what is in fact happening with this money that's being raised in the $100,000 level. But it seems to me that when you take away all of the rhetoric, when you're talking about the so-called soft money problem, you're really saying to the Federal Election Commission, we don't like it, but we're going to continue doing it until the rules are changed. What the Federal Election Commission is saying what you want us to do, critics of the commission, is to regulate state and local elections. Because that is the bottom line. What we're not talking about is the Dukakis committee or the Bush committee taking $100,000 from a corporation or an individual or a million dollars from an individual or corporation. What we're really talking about in this situation is what role political parties can play at the state and local and national level with regard to their entire ticket not just the presidential campaign, but state and local races as well. 
the commission has acknowledged that a political party committee can support its entire ticket what we're trying to decide and what we're concerned about is that when you do that you've got to allocate between your federal candidates and your state candidates and what we're concerned with is that the monies that are raised on behalf of the federal candidates and spent on behalf of the federal candidates are raised and spent under federal rules now what's happened is that there's this perception because you have the individuals involved like Mr. Farmer and Mr. Mossbacker with the campaigns as well as the parties that they are raising the monies for the campaign and there is no question that the people who are contributing the money think they're benefiting the campaign but what the commission has to be concerned with is how it's being spent if it's being put into the so-called non-federal accounts for non-federal candidates all we're concerned about is to make sure that the allocation between the two accounts is reasonable. For example, we've said in the past through advisory opinions, you can base it on the number of candidates you have on the ballot. But because of all this grandstanding, because of all these misperceptions, now the Commission is forced to come up with a more inflexible rule that's going to have to set some sort of a fixed met method whereby people know in a presidential election year how much can be spent out of the federal account and how much can be spent out of the non-federal account. The Commission has a number of proposals pending before it right now to amend the regulations early next year. Not in time for this presidential election, but what we see is how can parties be involved in the process. For everyone who criticizes the $100,000 that's going to the political party at the non-federal level, there are those who want the whole system to be changed and deregulate the political parties. So there is no amount of money or source of money that can be used for this kind of slate activity, party building activity, provided it's disclosed. Those again are going to be policy issues to be decided by Congress, not the Federal Election Commission. The Commission has to enforce the law as it is, not like people would like it to be, personally or otherwise. But I think what's happened as a result of this election is that the perception is out there, the system's falling apart because the presidential candidates are getting these large chunks of money. When in fact, on a legal basis, that is not true. On a perception basis, that very well may be true, and that's what we have to deal with through our regulations and through the law. Well, sure, because in effect you have 50 plus one, if, and plus one if you count the District of Columbia, different election systems, different rules, different regulations. Well, how can we, for example, tell the state of California in 1988 that 100% of its money has to come from federal sources when it has propositions, when it has its own state assembly races, and which has a law of its own that in some ways is much more restrictive than, elect than our federal election law? How can we trample on the jurisdiction of the states in some of these areas? What we've got to be sure about is that the monies that are spent for federal activity comes from federal sources and the monies for state come from state sources and leave it at that. So even if we change our regulations, it's not going to satisfy the critics of the agency that say, do more. The only way we can do more is if Congress changes the law. Uh, well, I know you're sitting on the edge of your seat to have me referee this uh, argument, <laughs> Phil and Bob. It is, it is true that for uh, several years that I know of, uh, the Republican National Committee, if uh, I would call ahead and make an appointment, would uh, allow me to come down and look at a very large computer printout with a lot of names and numbers on it, which they said was the, the, all of their soft money donors, except for the building fund folks, which they wouldn't show me. And um, so they have been making voluntary disclosure for some time. Um, Bob's uh, party, however, actually puts out a press release. I don't have to go down there and take notes. Uh, so, so they do it a little better than you do. <laughs> but, they've but, done it once. but they've done it once so far and aren't going to do it again until after the election. And uh, Bob, I don't care how much this embarrasses you, but I'm going to tell you folks that uh, if it was up to Bob, I know that they would be making regular disclosure that, uh, because that was his recommendation before this whole thing began. He was overruled by some of the party people who uh, would rather keep things secret. Um, the argument that one might give away where we're spending the money only holds water until you realize that what reporters are mostly asking for is who's giving the money, not where it's being spent. And it doesn't give away where the money is going if you disclose the donors and who gave it. Um, well, that's... Uh, that's all I have for now. We ought to get to some questions. Let me, uh, well, that's uh, 
that's all I have for now. We ought to get to some questions. Let me, the real uh, fun of this. I think we should, and, and I'm unfortunately, while you all are thinking of the questions that are right on the tip of your tongue, going to take the prerogative of the chair and, and ask the first question. Um, we really, and I think Bernadette uh, spelled this out quite clearly, are talking about two very separate systems. We're talking about how we fund presidential campaigns and some problems that there are there, and Brooks spelled it out as well, and, and also congressional campaigns. And uh, a lot of the press recently has been dealing with the presidential campaign, so I'm going to ask the question about congressional campaigns. 98.5% uh, of the incumbents who sought re-election in 1986 won re-election. We have no reason to think that number is going to decrease significantly this time. It's been over 90% in every election since 1972, which included the Watergate no, election. 40-something or another. Since 40-something right, or another? Right, right. I'm, I'm worried about that it included the... Uh, the Watergate Congress that included Reagan's landslide. Um, one of the reasons for this seems to be the significant, well, one of the reasons clearly is the poor quality of challengers. As somebody who sought to be a challenger, uh, I can say that with some modesty. Uh, um, but I think that's, that's a general perception. And one of the reasons that, that we have fairly poor challengers, I think, is because of the large amount of money that incumbents raise very early on and discourage people. Um, do you all who are involved in this think that there should be a, a way in which the election cycle is shortened for congressional elections? Or could be a way, if, uh, admitting clearly, uh, Tom, that it's not something the FEC could do, but it's certainly something that Congress could do. Is that the kind of reform that makes sense if the system should be more responsive? You could do two things. You could force the incumbents to, sp to spend the money in the year in which it is raised, mm -hmm. or in the cycle in which it is raised. Uh, and, and I think that that would... Uh, uh, that would be helpful. And you could impose another rule, and that would be that people can only raise money from the district in which, which they represent, which doesn't seem too strange. I mean, you know, they're raising it all from these lobbyists and PACs in Washington, but if you force them to raise it from where, they were, where their home was, they think that would make it a more le level playing field. Well, let's talk about the non-money things, which are who draws the district lines every 10 years. Uh, which is basically an incumbent's relationship with the state legislature. And in most every state, there's sort of an incumbent's agreement that nobody will rock the boat. Uh, why don't we take a look at what incumbents have given themselves as the perquisites of office since uh, 1974, 19, 1980? Let's look at the franking privilege. Uh, let's look at the number of times they go back home. Let's look at the free media that they get. Let's look at the amount of name identification that they have established. I mean, money is clearly a factor, but it is not the only factor. And I would argue that you could equalize money or perhaps inhibit the incumbents and give three or four times as much money to the typical challenger. And that challenger will still be disadvantaged because of the way the lines are drawn and just the built-in advantages that most incumbents have had. Most incumbents who are still there, at least in the House, are there because they've become very adaptable. They are not the ideologues of the right or the left who were there in the 1960s or the 1970s. Those individuals have been defeated. The ones who are there now tend to be the accommodationists that I've talked about, that the accommodating of conflicting interests is what the legislative process is all about. And most of the incumbents who are there have learned how to accommodate the conflicting interests of their constituencies, and that's why they survive. I mean, you could do away with the dollar advantages, and I doubt that you'd have very many differences in the outcome of the elections. I get back to uh, how the district lines are drawn. Anybody else want to comment on that before I open it to the floor? Brooks, yes, on. please. I, uh, it's, it's true the franking privilege is an enormous advantage. Uh, House member can send out six mailings to every person, every household in the district each year, free. Um, it's true staff is a huge advantage. What is it, 20 staffers they get now? On the average, eight are working, not in Washington, but in the districts of the uh, uh, House members. Mobile offices. Well, they've gotten away with those since the gas crisis right. came up. Phil Sharp still got some old Winnebago <laughs> that uh, he's uh, with, because uh, one of his staffers loves to drive it around the district. But they'll have two and three district offices. These are perquisites of office, and they're very, uh, they, they really do keep incumbents in office. That's true. But... Another perquisite of office is political action committee money. It has become a perk, and it is the new element, I think, that is raising these re-election rates. Actually, they did get down to, I think, 87 percent in the Reagan landslide and, and below 90 percent in, in, uh, in 74, if I co recollect correctly. But um, 
But we've never had one 98 percent, but we're likely to have, I think, uh, two in a row. We've had one, we're going to have another one. Um, gerrymandering, overrated as a, uh, an incumbent protection device, I think. It doesn't explain why Richard Stallings, a reasonably uh, middle-of-the-road Democrat, survives in uh, Idaho in probably the most Republican district in the country. Well, and, but look at his voting record. He's not voting the way a northern Democrat is voting. He's, well, how did he go on contra aid? I've forgotten. I mean, he goes with the party often enough, and it doesn't... Uh, he doesn't he, vote the way Hanson voted he, either, though. He doesn't vote the way George Hanson voted. That's true. Now, in Rhode well, Island, you have... he doesn't vote the way Frank Church did either. <laughs> in, Ro in Rhode Island, you have, in, you have Claudine Schneider, who is now uh, uh, cemented firmly in a very, very Democratic district. Well, look how she votes. Well, she did finally got the AFL's endorsement. <laughs> they finally gave up. Now... Uh, the point is that uh, these folks do adapt to their, di their districts, yes, but gerrymandering doesn't uh, preclude one party from seizing control. Um, I don't know how much they've actually mellowed. I look at uh, B1 Bob Dornan in California, and I'm wondering. Uh, if they haven't, I don't think they've all been. Defeated. <laughs> uh, I think the special interest money system as, as the, uh, the share of, of special interest money, not just PAC money, because individuals give special interest money too, but as that uh, overwhelms the, uh, the system, you get incumbents uh, going from a, a 90 or 95 percent likelihood of re-election to something like a 98 percent likelihood of re-election, and that's bad for the country. Let me open it to you, and if you could stand and identify yourself, and if you want to address the question of a particular person, that would be wonderful. As we're talking about ways that you can try to bring more equity in the playing field to incumbents and challengers when it comes to an election, at the congressional level, is public finance, the way the presidential elections are publicly financed, one of the options? And I'd like to open it to all the panelists. Well, I'll start simply because I don't make policy. I can give you some of the basis. That is, in fact, been uh, presented to Congress this past year and, and in other years, and it uh, never could seem to get out of Congress. Now, the issue there is when you're dealing with a presidential race, you have a matching fund program in the primary and a grant program in the general election. The first issue you have to decide in a congressional race is will you have a primary program and a general program or just a general program? And if you have both a primary and general program, how can you possibly regulate that kind of activity. Uh, there are a number of ways that people have looked at public financing. For example, indirectly through some sort of a tax credit kind of uh, uh, scenario. Um, is public uh, financing the answer for congressional races? Congress has so far not decided that. I don't think Congress will ever personally pass public financing of congressional races. Uh, but I do think Congress is going to make some major changes in the election laws next year. Both committees are committed to doing something about it, and hopefully they'll look at it and not in the short term. The problem you have with the election laws, we have so much data, and Brooks Jackson can take that data and tell you exactly what it means, and people on both sides <laughs> will say, okay, if we raise this limit or lower this limit, this is going to be the short-term effect for our side. And when that happens, Nothing happens. Uh, what you've got to do is get Congress to focus in on the election laws uh, without a preconceived idea to forget the short term, but practically speaking in politics, that's not going to happen, that people are going to look at the short term effects on their particular party, and as a result, you get into these stalemates. The last time we had a change in the election law was 1980. Those changes to the law were relatively minor. They basically took away a lot of the commission's authority, quite frankly. But in order to pass even that minor change, you had a commitment and a consensus between the House Democrats and Republicans and the Senate Democrats and Republicans. And after you had that consensus, then they brought forth a bill. What I think Congress is going to attempt in 1989 is another consensus piece of legislation. But hopefully this time, they'll forget some of the short-term effects and look at a long-term projection to this law. That's the only way any, any legitimate reform is ever going to take place in this area. If people can say, forget the short-term and look at the long-term. Well, even on that uh, law, one of the things that they did, they said there, there are no po pockets in the shroud. You can't take it with you. So you have to you return it to the federal government if you, when you retire. 
And uh, before that, you could take it into that was your retirement account. But they had to grandfather that because it was against a lot of people's self-interest, so they grandfathered it. So anyone who was in Congress then could take it with them. And they still there are many people still in Congress who, will, when they retire, they've got a million dollar retirement fund. One of the things they, they very rarely act against their self-interest. I'm not talking Republicans or Democrats. I'm just saying that when you're in there, you look at it. And that when you're talking about the, the public financing of these uh, House and Senate seats, everybody there is going to say, why would I want to give money to my challenger, to the fellow who's going to run against me, woman or man? And keep myself to spending only that amount when I can raise more if I need it. Of course. Well, that's part of the problem is the diversity of 435 congressional districts. Usually the concept of public funding comes with the concept of limits and the notion that there is a limit that is fair and that is equally applied across the country. And it's very difficult to convince a, an incumbent from an urban district that uh, he or she can get by with something less than someone from a rural district can get by with or whether or not someone has a tradition of fairly competitive primaries before they get where they are and then facing a general election. I think the average Southern Democrat now doesn't view their election as safe as they might have 10 or 20 years ago when there wasn't a competitive Republican Party or there weren't the changes within the Democratic parties in their districts. So I very much doubt that even if Congress could agree that it was good public policy to fund elections out of the general treasury funds, that they would ever agree to what the equitable limit was congressional district by congressional district. They're just too diverse. You know, population isn't the only factor. Population media, is media not markets, the media market. Um, geography. Types of electorate. Your question? My name is Wendy Goldberg, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And I had a question for Mr. Jackson. As you probably know, S2, which is the Campaign Finance Reform Act, was filibustered to death on the floor of the Senate by Republicans during the 100th Congress. And in the short run, do you see any hope for a reincarnation of S2? Well, I hope not, because I think it was a bad bill. It was uh, primarily, at the end, a spending limit bill. It had a little bit of public money in it, just enough to make spending limits fly with uh, the Supreme Court, supposedly. And um, although Republicans were pilloried for opposing reform, quote unquote, as it was defined by common cause in the Democrats, it was a purely partisan debate on the floor of the Senate, you had, almost purely. You had uh, two Republicans who voted uh, with the Democrats, I think in the end only Fritz Hollings, a Democrat voting with the Republicans. Um, and this reflects what you've heard here, that there is a kind of a partisan deadlock right now. Neither party wants to move because they're afraid in the short term their interests are going to be hurt. Um, I used to oppose public financing just on the grounds that uh, for, in congressional races it would only serve to make uh, congressmen and senators even more independent of party authority and presidential influence than they are already. I think one of the reasons Jimmy Carter's presidency failed was because his own Democrats in Congress wouldn't go along with some of his quite reasonable uh, proposals. Uh, the next president I predict, whether he's, it's George Bush or Mike Dukakis, is going to suffer Jimmy Carter's fate because every member of Congress, almost without exception, will have been elected and re-elected by a much greater margin than whoever the president is. And I have no particular reason, to, there are no coattails anymore, I have no particular reason to listen to uh, whoever's in the White House, whether it's a person of his own party or not. Um, having said that, I think there's an enormous opportunity for getting something through Congress next year because Republicans who have opposed bitterly uh, spending limits up until now and who have defended the political action committee system, um, I think with uh, less and less heart, but they've defended it nonetheless, are now ready to turn around and completely blow it away. There are uh, uh, Bob Dole, uh, Bob Michael. Uh, there are, it's hard to name a Republican leader in the House or the Senate who isn't, wouldn't, under the proper circumstances, vote for a bill that wouldn't just limit PACs, but would put the limit right down to zero. No political action committee donations at all. Uh, given that, I think you s will see uh, coalitions built that were undreamed of a year ago, six months ago. Um, personally, I'm not quite as radical as my friend Bob Farmer. Uh, I wouldn't limit contributions to people from merely your own district, although I think that there's a, a, a nice moral and ethical basis for doing that, and, and it's a nice political argument. It'd be very difficult to enforce. I would 
limit candidates to taking money from people within their state, which is easy to enforce and approximates uh, uh, taking money from your own constituents, and their political parties. I would deregulate parties. I think it's crazy to have limits on what political parties can do for their own congressional nominees. We have a law now that says that the Democratic Party or the Republican Party can give to a candidate about 10 percent of what it costs on the average to get elected. It's no wonder the parties are declining in influence. <laughs> you know, the political action committees can give without limit in the aggregate. The parties are limited. It's crazy. We should get away with that. Brooks, would you put limits on what people and organizations could give to sure. parties? Then? Oh, I, well, and yes, and yes, I would. I think you need you need to solve two problems. One is the the influence of special interest money, and and you do that by limiting donations. But at the same time, you need to get money to challengers. So I don't think we spend enough, certainly on challengers. How do we get? non-special interest money into campaigns in a non-bureaucratic way that can take uh, cognizance of the fact that districts are different. I would subsidize the political parties. I'd give them a whole bunch of money. And I'd give them new fundraising apparatuses like a payroll checkoff system run through the Social Security system so that they can, I think, direct mail, which is pretty much seen its day, is declining and is exhausted medium and is very expensive. I think we need more efficient fundraising mechanisms for parties. It's a very long answer to your question, and I hope it uh, addresses it. Could you go to one of the microphones with the other people? My name is Thalia Schlesinger, and I've been involved in politics for, I won't say how many years. In 1974, I worked in a congressional campaign that cost $90,000. In 1980, I did a congressional campaign that cost a million four. We're all addressing raising the money. I'd like to address spending the money. That's really the focus of where the push is to raise the money, and a large part of it is both uh, the media and the postal costs and the fact that the volunteers aren't there anymore because that pool of quote-unquote women who stayed home have gone into the workforce. That's really changed politics, I think, as much as anything that I know, and I would like to hear comments from the panel on that. Well, I think that's true. I've been involved in elections since 1970, and I notice a, a declining pool of volunteers. Uh, even today, you read about uh, the presidential campaigns who are paying people to go door to door in a major state like California. Well, in the earlier days, you would find students or senior citizens willing to do that, or you would find the stay-at-home woman and you don't find those people anymore. So it may be inevitable that we do have to hire people to do the things that, are, that need to be done in campaigns. And not that they're hired guns, but why should they do it for free if the money is available to be paid? So I do think that there is a declining role of the volunteer. All of us have a boogeyman in the process. My boogeyman are the, the consultants that every candidate is now taught. If you don't have a stable of consultants, you're not a real candidate, and the party won't give you money, and the PACs won't give you money. So the first thing every poor candidate does is go out and sign up a whole bunch of consultants who may or may not know what they're doing, uh, who get paid only if you put money on television. So by definition, there's a bias toward television in many of the modern campaigns, even for the House, even when it may be ineffective. You're absolutely right, postal rates have gone up. All of the things that the candidates have to purchase in order to communicate with the voters have gone up. And our interest collectively in elections has gone down. And I don't know how we solve that. I don't think we solve it by we don't solve those problems by changing the mix of where the money comes from. We still have a candidate with the problem of figuring out how to communicate with very diverse and multiply interested voters who aren't appealed to by the same simplistic messages they used to be and who are not necessarily as led by the organizations they belong to as they used to. Tom? It's interesting that you focus in on the spending of the money because that's exactly the reason given for having a system like public financing at the presidential level and now at the congressional level. There are a lot of people who don't like the concept of using the taxpayer funds at the congressional level but think that's the only way they can limit spending. Uh, I'm not so sure that's true under the Supreme Court cases. I think there could be a lot more imaginative approaches taken. But the issue that you talked about, for example, the media, there have been a number of proposals pending before Congress which would give free time but not the kind of free time to air the 30-second spot, the so-called glitz spot, but the 30 minutes or the 15 minutes to have a legitimate discussion on an issue. 
Candidates, when they're offered that, don't want that. They'd rather have the 30-second spot that they have to pay for and hire the consultant to pay a million dollars to do it. So I don't know how you bridge that gap, even if you provide the service and you allow uh, free media time or free postage. Uh, there was a period of time, I'm not sure it's still there with all the changes that were made, but political parties had the ability to use the nonprofit mailing rate. Uh, maybe that kind of thing could be provided to candidates. But again, when you get to that level, they rather send out the glitz, something that's coming back Federal Express and something that has all the fundraising materials as opposed to something that could be sent at that level of, of uh, mailing. So not only do you have the problem of coming up with solutions legislatively, you've got the bigger problem of getting, in my view, campaigns to utilize those because they're, they think they're losing something by not having that consult, not having that fundraising piece that looks professional and using some of the so-called volunteer exemptions, which are under the law right now, but uh, unless they are using volunteers, they have to pay for and attribute them as contributions or expenditures. So you have a two-pronged test, but hopefully, again, when Congress considers these legislative changes, those are the kinds of things that they will consider. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one. Dave? I'd like to ask the uh, fundraisers what they've found in their, in their experience of what uh, givers uh, are, are expecting to get as a result of their contributions. Somebody that they like elected. <laughs> re-elected. <laughs> elected or re-elected, sure. Phil? Bob? Either of you want to? I, I would agree with that. And good government. I think government. most are civic-minded civic individuals. And uh, well, I, you all they do at like those the, middle America, middle class values. But that's but they been also, my experience. And they, they also really like the personal believe. relationship mm -hmm. with a candidate, mm -hmm. uh, which is, that does provide them. Mm -hmm. People often ask me, what do you say to somebody when you're asking them for $100,000? And uh, it's a legitimate question. I've had reporters sit in on some of those meetings. Essentially, uh, it's not a very hard sell because you don't talk somebody into giving $100,000. They have to down deep kind of want to do it. And most of the people that you're asking to participate at that level are very well-to-do, very rich. And all I say to them is, look, this could make a difference. This election is very important. The process is very important. The money that you give could change history, could make a difference to your children and your grandchildren. And, uh, you know, we'd appreciate it if you'd, you know, become one of the very few people in the country who participates at that level, who has the capacity to do so. There are those fundraisers who will say it's just as hard to raise $100 as it is 100000 if the person has the capability of giving the 100000 But in, in, in response to the people who are skeptical about that, we have had a policy from the very beginning of this campaign. As I said, we've had over 1,150 meetings with people. There is always a deputy of mine in the room with me, always, so that nobody says something that isn't immediately corrected. Uh, because when you're talking about money and politics, Sure, Phil would agree with this. Uh, it's a very sensitive area. If there's a potential for abuse, that's one area where it is. And uh, when you're playing at this level, for the stakes for which you're playing, you want to make sure that it's done absolutely in a pristine and squeaky clean manner. That's how we've tried to do it, and I'm sure, you know, I've heard nothing to suggest that, that anybody's having problems this year in that regard. I want to thank you all. I think. Uh a number of the comments and suggestions uh, that you have made say to me and say to this audience that this is a topic which is not going to go away, that it will be on the legislative agenda for the 101st Congress, that it will be on the desk in the Oval Office when the new president uh, arrives there. And I think that you've given us all some very good ideas and, and food for thought in the future. Thank you all very much, and thank you all very much.